this is an example of something that's a big deal because it's part of a transition in medium scale from a world in which we're all separate to something in which everything is connected. Your shoes talk to the wall, the wall talks to you, you talk to the lighting, all of it without active participation on your part. This is a top view of something which is, you see there's a dime and there's the size of the object. These are all little channels that happen there to be filled with, with dye. And that's going to be used to make a chip, a little fluidic chip in which the fluid that runs around in the channels are not electrons, as in a microelectronic device, but are used to make a fluorine-18 radioactively labeled compound. Well, why is that interesting? It's interesting for an application called PET, or positron emission tomography. And positron emission tomography is something in which you can see molecules connecting to receptors in vivo. So it's potentially interesting in looking at, let's say, where the tumor is on your liver. Is the resolution good? No, the resolution is atrocious. On the other hand, the idea in this is that what one is going to do is to take x-ray pictures which have very, very high spatial resolution and very low chemical resolution and combine it with this technique which has very low spatial resolution but very high chemical resolution to provide a wonderful picture of where the tumor is on your liver. Now, I don't know whether that's going to be helpful to you or not. However, um, GE paid for a company that does something of this sort, paid $7 billion a year or so ago, which gives you the impression that GE thinks it's going to be terrific. So capitalism being what it is, you can draw your own conclusions about that. But here you're working with things of the size of hairs. Here you're working with things that are just, I mean, after all, this entire thing from here to here is a hundredth of a hair, and then this is even bigger than that. So there are different sizes for different purposes. Okay, historically, why is it that you've heard about nano but haven't heard about quantum optics or haven't heard about some of the other things that go on? There are a whole series of really interesting opportunities at any time in science and technology for to emerge, something to emerge as the, the uh, Celine Dion of the world the world of physical science. Just think about some of the ones. My personal bet is the one that's going to change the world in the next period of time is intelligent machines. Because in the great competitions between the developed world and the developing world, the big difference is basically cost of labor. We can never compete on that basis, so what we will do is make machines that eliminate labor with unusual consequences for the future. But there are a lot of other interesting things here, and sustainable is certainly an interesting one. Why is that not the same buzz? It's actually getting there, but not been the case. Technology for globalization, soft robotics, whatever it might be. How is it that nano emerged as the flavor of the moment, and what's the background for this? Is it a unique opportunity? Well, no. The reason it emerged is a complex set of parameters which in combination have set off this interest. The first idea is something which was basically, I, how do I put this really politically correctly and politely, it was nonsense. Um, which was the original idea of little anti-cancer submarines. There was a notion that you could take the machines that we see in the world and simply make them smaller and smaller and smaller and then you put them in the bloodstream and they go and find cancer cells, or they, the one that people worried about was something called the assembler, which was supposed to be like a little robot that would pick atoms out of the environment, make more of itself, and expand exponentially. Just total nonsense. But sort of neat nonsense. So everybody likes to go to bed with this little frisson of terror going down their back, so long as they don't really believe it's true. That was called great goo. That caught the attention. There's some very real opportunities here. Um, the Science, as in automobile selling, as in teaching, as in anything, is always a melange of self-advertisement and reality and accomplishment and promise and whatever. The ratio of hyperbole to reality here has been, it gives you great confidence in the species. The enthusiasm sometimes exceeded the reality. Science politics, one of the issues here was that there is a general appreciation if you're in the world of science policy, that the United States 
allocates too many resources, too large a fraction of its resources to public health. Um, what's changed the world in the last period of time has not been genomics, it has been information. I mean, our world has been rewired by the internet. Um, it hasn't been rewired by the genome. But most of the money has gone into the genome in the last period of time. So how does one correct that in a political world? And the answer is you find some part of the politics in which all the sciences can get together, and that's turned out to be nano. There are some really big deals in terms of technology which we'll come to, and then not a small thing is that one of the areas that makes things happen in the United States is the venture capital world. And the venture capital world was looking for a what's called new, new thing at the time that nano was first emerging, and so it picked on nano as being an interesting subject. And in venture capital, you don't really care how things work out in a certain sense so long as there's a lot of stirring of the pot. Okay, so I want to organize the discussion of the subject in terms of six ideas. Three in science and three in technology. I'm going to pass very briefly over this issue of quantum phenomena, but I want to make it evident that this is part of the story. The ability for the first time to look at single atoms and molecules, to actually see them. And I'm a chemist by background, and it is remarkable that my entire career was spent talking about atoms and molecules, although I've never seen a molecule. I mean, I infer it's there, but I've never actually seen one. For the first time, it's possible to see them. A whole bunch of neat things in terms of the cell and biology. And then the, the technologies are, the dominating one is information. The one that is probably the newest at the moment is materials. And then what I think is going to end up being the biggest deal is energy, water, the environment, sustainability, and so on. Those are the ones that are going to make a big difference. So that's the organization. Now, let's start here. This is something you've all seen. It's just a prism. And in the prism and in diffraction is essentially everything you ever want to know about quantum mechanics. I mean, diffraction has it all. And in particular, it has, to me, one of the most unnerving equations in natural science, which is this one. Which is very interesting. I'm a teacher, you're a teacher. I suspect you have the same problem that I do, which is it is sometimes very difficult to get students to appreciate that an equation is, is telling you something. You know, it's not just a black box in which you drop pennies and something comes out at the end. To me, an equation is very much like poetry. And what it is is a description of reality in a form that we can't otherwise really describe. This one says that for electrons or things of that sort, that the wavelength of the electron, we'll say, is related to mass and velocity, that is, the momentum. The thing that's amazing about this is wavelength, this is wave, and momentum, that is particle. And so that's an expression of the wave-particle duality. And if you stop and think about it, not just as a simple equation, but as a statement of reality, it really does send shivers up and down your spine. Now, the last time I used this slide was for a course that I'm giving. And I, I use different poems. I'm sorry, I forgot to really change it. The poem I much prefer is one by Margaret Atwood, which I will now recite for you. It's politically incorrect in the course of a course. It, the poem is four lines. It is, you fit into me like a hook into an eye. Beautiful Margaret Atwood erotic image. A fish hook, an open eye. Um, Margaret Atwood is not terribly fond of men, I think. <laughs> but that's an expression of reality in a very economical way. This and this are, you know, they're the same kind of thing. We just need to think about it. But this gets into the issue of why is it that if I take an electron and flick it at the wall, it goes through, if I do it the right way. And if I take you and you flick you into the wall, you're really very, very annoyed because whatever happens, you don't go through the wall. And when you and I discuss it afterwards, I'm likely to lose teeth. And if any of you would like to discuss the nature of reality as it is, <clears throat> it's one of my favorite subjects. It really is extraordinarily interesting. All right, single atoms and molecules. Here the issue is a 
an idea that, that before was really very unexpected. And that is, when we see something, you know, to see means photons and eyes. Basically, that's the idea. And the question is, when you go to something that's very small, small enough that diffraction tells you that you can't see it, how do you see it? And the answer that turned out to be the right answer, and a little bit unexpectedly, was you feel it. And of course, the reason for that is that if I feel something, the uncertainty in the contact of surfaces is in the order of the van der Waals uh, interaction. It's the size of, a, of an atom, which means really a tenth of an angstrom or something like that. There's no uncertainty down to that point. With light, there's an uncertainty at hundreds of nanometers. So it turns out that the way that you see, see in quotes, atoms and molecules is by various devices that are basically fingers of one or another kind. And the classic atomic force microscope is something in which I have a finger, and I bring the finger down and you know, feel my wrist that way. As I try to bring this over, my arm has to rise up a little bit. And you can detect that motion, the motion of a finger here feeling a surface that has atom-sized bumps on it by watching tiny deflections in this arm, the cantilever arm, in a device of this sort. So there's the sample. Here is the cantilever, which with the finger that feels things, you shine light from a laser down on this. It reflects into a position-sensitive detector. And you can detect changes in that position of you know, easily a tenth of an angstrom by um, watching where the beam is deflected over there. So here is the a real picture of what one sees here. This is from Don Eigler, and it's a kind of poster child for this area. Each of those things that you see is an iron atom on a copper surface. So you're really seeing atoms. I'm so happy to see them. I know they exist for the first time. And then what you often see is a picture of this sort. And it's a representation of what this is supposed to be. But this is what you really see. An atom, of course, doesn't look like an ice cream cone. An atom is a sphere. But if I try to bring a probe over that, the probe will, will make a kind of inverted pyramid shape. It can't feel underneath the sphere. So that's why these things have a kind of ice cream cone shape. This series of ripples in the background is just like water in the bathtub. It is fundamentally ripples in the electron sea, the sea of electrons that's in the surface. And what you're seeing here, if you see a point there and a point there, that's exactly the same thing as the whispering gallery in Washington when you take the kids down to see that. You stand here, and the sound is reflected to there, and there's a standing wave in the electrons. So the phenomena are basically very much the same. If you understand, if the kids understand these simple things of how electrons move around atoms, it turns out that you can construct the periodic table in a way that makes perfect sense. The periodic table is just the hydrogen atom and the quantum mechanics of that being worked out. And here's what a finger actually looks like. It's, here's a tip. And then this particular finger has a long projection, which is a carbon nanotube. That's 10 nanometers. So this is about 2 nanometers across, means 4 gold atoms. And the carbon nanotubes are so strong that they actually are freestanding at that kind of dimension. So imagine that 4 atoms across and feeling the surface with it. It's really amazing that it works as well as it does. <laughs>